Move the questions without notice and I table further information with respect to questions asked by Senator Waters last week. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. When JobKeeper ends at the end of March, how many people will lose their jobs? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, the advice that the Secretary of the Treasury uh, has, uh, has given to parliamentary committees uh, is that he expects the jobs recovery and the economic recovery in Australia to continue. What we have seen uh, during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic is very clearly uh, that the measures our government took saved jobs. JobKeeper, by various estimates, has saved some 700,000 uh, jobs. What we have seen in relation to the 1.3 million Australians who lost their jobs or went to zero hours at the height of the pandemic is that 93 per cent of them have come back. 93 per cent of those jobs have come back during that time. And what we anticipate, and indeed what the advice from the Treasury, from the Reserve Bank, is that we should continue to expect to see that jobs recovery. Now, that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that there won't be, as we have said consistently from the start of the pandemic, the, that not every job nor every business will be able to be saved. Not every will be able to be saved. And these are quite infantile comments coming from some such a senator. What opposite, to be quite frank? These are difficult, challenging issues. But what we have sought to do is put in place the measures to protect the Australian economy, to protect the capacity in the Australian economy, and it has saved hundreds of thousands of jobs along the way. And we are seeing new jobs created. That in net terms, new jobs are being created so far each and every month. That yes, there are some jobs that are being lost, but more are being created as a result of the measures the government is putting in place. And post March, there will continue to be enormous stimulus, enormous activity across the Australian economy as a result of the different policy measures that our government continues Order. to put Senator in place. Senator Birmingham, Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Reserve Bank Governor expects additional job losses to occur when JobKeeper ends at the end of March. Minister, youth unemployment is more than double the national unemployment rate, sitting at 13.9 per cent. How many more young people will lose their job when JobKeeper ends? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, we absolutely acknowledge that there is a particular challenge with youth unemployment. That's why in the budget last year we put in place the JobMaker hiring credit as a policy proposal specific to younger Australians. And those opposite decided to come in and vote against and filibuster and make difficult the implementation of the JobMaker hiring credit. We did that because we looked back at the advice around previous recessions and we knew that younger people in a recession were more likely to find it harder to come back into the workforce than older people. And the evidence is actually proving that to be the case, justifying the policy decisions that our government took. As we've always said through this pandemic, the responses we want to put in place will be targeted and they'll be proportionate. And that's precisely what we've done in relation to youth unemployment there, that the JobMaker hiring credit is there uh, to help target additional support for young Australians because we knew Order, that that's Senator where it Birmingham. would be needed. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. The Treasury Secretary expects to see job losses and, and I quote, a pause in the labour market after JobKeeper ends at the end of March. In South Australia, unemployment went up to 7.1 per cent in the last month. How many more South Australians will lose their jobs when JobKeeper ends? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Mr President, what we expect to see, and indeed what the Treasury Secretary, who you just quoted, has told parliamentary inquiries, is that he expects to see continued recovery in relation to the employment market, that he expects to see that continuing post the end of March. Now, Mr President, I know those opposite seem to think that somehow, somehow there is a bottomless pit of taxpayer money and that forever and a day we might be able to run the type of subsidies or supports or otherwise across the Australian economy, but that is just not feasible. That is just not feasible. The Australian economy and private sector businesses cannot be run on borrowed dollars and taxpayer dollars forever. 
The measures we've put in place have got us through the depths of the pandemic. We've taken different transitional steps, and in those different transitional steps at the end of September, at the end of the December, those opposites said the sky would fall in, and it didn't. Employment continued to grow, grow unemployment continued to grow down, Order, and that is what Birmingham we're going to continue to work towards. Has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the start of the plan to roll out the COVID vaccine across the nation? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Chandler, for the question. Rolling out the COVID vaccine across the country is one of the government's highest priorities. We all encourage all Australians, when your turn comes, to take the opportunity to line up and receive a vaccine that will protect you, protect your families and protect the broader community and the country. Yesterday, Mr President, we saw 84-year-old Sydney aged care resident Jane Malziak become the first person in Australia to be vaccinated against the virus. The Prime Minister also received his COVID-19 shot, as did our Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly, Chief Nurse and Midwifery Officer Alison McMillan. Vaccinating the Prime Minister, our CMO and Chief Nurse is a demonstration to show all Australians our faith in the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines we're providing. This week is a historic week for Australia and all Australians. Tens of thousands will begin to receive their vaccinations starting with the most vulnerable first, part of the phased rollout strategy. We have prioritised the most vulnerable people in our society to receive the COVID-19 vaccine first. A team of healthcare professionals will deliver 30,000 vaccines to aged care residents across 240 facilities in 190 communities across the country. In Tasmania, Senator Chandler, the vaccine has rollout has begun today in aged care homes in, the, in, in uh, our home state and at the Royal Hobart Hospital in Hobart. A further 50,000 vaccines nationally for border quarantine and frontline health workers will be delivered through 16 hospital hubs, including the one in Hobart, Mr President. I'd like to reinforce what the Chief Medical Officer said yesterday. I trust that most, most Australians will take this vaccine once Order. it becomes Senator available. Colbeck, Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Minister for his response. Can the Minister outline how the National Vaccine Program will reach our population through a phased rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Today we have begun phase 1A of our national rollout strategy, looking after the most vulnerable in our community, including aged care residents and staff. Phase 1B will include adults aged over 70 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, and high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire, emergency services and meat processing workers. Phase 2A includes adults aged 50 to 69 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 18 to 54 years, and other critical high-risk workers. Phase 2B expands the to the remainder of the population within Australia over the age of 16. Mr President, this is the biggest national vaccination program we have ever seen. And can I pay tribute to all of the health professionals, the dedicated prof health professionals who are making this happen? Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister also update the Senate on how Australians are being kept informed of the vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Our comprehensive information campaign will keep Australians fully informed and up to date about how and where to get the jab. As part of our public information campaign, we've invested in a program for peak multicultural organisations to help reach culturally and ling linguistically diverse communities. This includes advertising in 32 languages, Mr President. Our message will target specific multicultural groups to ensure everyone in Australia has a full understanding of the vaccination program. The overall national campaign includes regular website updates, social media, local community and grassroots organisations, networks and, of course, the media. There are three steps, Mr President, 
that Australians can take now to get ready. Firstly, create a MyGov account and link to Medicare. Two, check your contact details for Medicare, ensure they're up to date. And three, Order. view Senator your immunisation history the record. Answer has expired. Senator Polly. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. On Thursday, the Prime Minister disclosed in House Question Time that the Minister met with the Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police on the 4th of April. What was the purpose of this meeting? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, look, I th thank you, Mr. President, and I thank uh, the Senator for the question. Um, as I made very clear in my statement on Thursday, that during my meeting with Brittany, uh, that she would have my full support in whatever course of action she chose to take, and that she would have full access to counselling services, and that if she wished, I would assist her get access to the Australian Federal Police. And without betraying any confidences, as I have consistently not done here, uh, I did, through my staff, reach out to the Australian Federal Police for an appropriately qualified uh, person to talk to Brittany, and that is my understanding of what occurred. Senator, Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Was Ms. Higgins aware that the minister was meeting with the Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police? Senator Reynolds. Uh, look again, that goes into the matter of private conversations, which I, which. Which I have consistently, which I have order. consistently Senator, I've got Senator said Wong. remains. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong, uh, the point of order is relevance. Uh, I think we showed uh, some courtesy for how the minister was last week. That does not obviate her obligation to be accountable to this chamber for her conduct. For her conduct, and she is being asked a question, Mr. President about whether or not this meeting occurred with the permission or with the knowledge of the complainant. There is no prejudice associated with that. It is a matter in which the Prime Minister has spoken about in the House, and I'd ask the Minister to respond to the question. I've allowed you to make the point, Senator Wong. I, I don't believe that the Minister is not being directly relevant because I think she is addressing the question. Um, there is an opportunity to debate questions after question time. I'll call Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, I'll continue because it was only seven, uh, seven seconds. So as, as I've consistently said, um, on that Monday, uh, we made available and advised that we would provide and make available the appropriate counselling services, uh, which was done. And also that if she wanted to talk to the Australian Federal Police, uh, that we would facilitate that at all times and all times through that process. Uh, as I've said in this chamber a number of times, everything that was done was with her knowledge and was with her knowledge and with her concurrence. Uh, from that day uh, right through, uh, it is always it has always been uh, my first and only consideration was her privacy, her agency, and to take Order. my steps. Senator, Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Why was this meeting not disclosed in the Minister's previous answers or statement to the Senate last week? Was the Minister aware that the Prime Minister was going to disclose this detail in the House? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you. And I think, as I said twice in the Chamber last week, that I did facilitate uh, a meeting for Ms Higgins, if she wanted one, uh, with the Australian Federal Police. And it was uh, assistant, the Assistant Commissioner uh, who came up to my office and met briefly with me alone and then, and then she dealt with and then, and then I took all advice. Again, I took all advice. And then the AFP met with uh, Brittany, and that was the conclusion of my engagement because I had made the reference to the AFP. And again, what we discussed in those meetings 
is not my story to tell. It is, it, is not, it is not my story to tell and I have always and I continue to respect her privacy and her story and I, I will Senator continue Reynolds. to do so. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on the recent Quad Ministerial meeting and advise how Australia, India, Japan and the United States are deepening cooperation on shared regional priorities in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question and her interest in, uh, in these issues. Mr President, uh, Australia regards the, the Quad uh, as a positive diplomatic arrangement with an agenda to match. It brings together four like-minded democracies, Australia, the United States, India and Japan, committed to respecting and upholding international rules and obligations through positive practical engagement to protect and support the sovereignty, the prosperity and the security of our region. Uh, late last week, my three Quad counterparts and I discussed some of the most pressing issues facing our region, including our common recovery from COVID-19 in both health and economic terms, including our joint commitment to tackling climate change, the equitable distribution of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines and broader health security issues such as reducing the risk of future pandemics. Uh, ministers and secretaries reaffirmed our, commitment, reaffirmed our commitment to strengthening the Indo-Pacific's health and economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis in a way that helps us all, all countries in the region, reinforce their sovereignty and their resilience. Uh, we particularly welcomed the new US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, less than a month after his confirmation and welcomed strong engagement and energy from the United States in relation to deepening Quad cooperation and regional engagement across the Pacific uh, more broadly. This was, in fact, the third meeting of the Quad at the level of foreign ministers, following earlier in-person meetings in New York uh, in 2019, last year in Tokyo in 2020, notwithstanding the COVID-19 uh, challenges uh, that uh, travel presents, uh, both of which I was pleased to attend. We have committed to meeting at least annually, and I'm confident the value of these meetings will only grow and ensure our cooperation on tackling regional challenges deepens in a way that benefits Order. our whole Senator region. Payne. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, will the minister advise the importance of Australia, India, Japan and the United States working together on shared regional priorities, uh, and particularly, of course, in relation to the pandemic? Senator Payne. Thanks, Mr President, and uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. I, I think it's important to note that Thursday's uh, Quad meeting was another chance to reaffirm our support for ASEAN centrality, and particularly the principles set out in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. We're working to, secure a, to support a secure and prosperous region through ASEAN-led architecture, particularly through the East Asia Summit, which again met virtually uh, in the context of COVID last year. We are long-standing supporters of Myanmar's democratic transition. So we discussed our concerns about uh, the military coup. We reaffirm, reaffirmed our support for an ASEAN-led response to those events. We have multiple engagements of our four nations in a range of areas. Uh, last October, for example, I joined uh, counterparts from Japan and the United States to announce the first project under the Trilateral Partnership for Infrastructure Development in the Indo-Pacific, the Palau Cable Spur in um, uh, I think it was in September, Minister Birmingham participated Order. in an Australia-India-Japan meeting on resilient supply has chains. Expired. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr President. Will the minister advise the Senate how these engagements are vital to upholding rules and norms in our region? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. These are very important engagements because the Quad's positive agenda uh, complements Australia's other bilateral, regional and multilateral engagements, including, of course, as I said in my previous response, with ASEAN, to support an open, inclusive and resilient region anchored in international law. We reiterated our commitment to ongoing practical work deepening Quad cooperation on regional priorities that were agreed at our in-person meeting in Tokyo last year. Uh, they include maritime security, infrastructure, supply chain resilience, as I've mentioned, counter-terrorism, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, cyber, countering disinformation, 
as uh, just a number. We discussed the importance of deepening our cooperation to address climate change, including Australia's focus on supporting adaptation and resilience in the Pacific through our $1.5 billion climate finance commitment through to 2025. So despite the significant disruption that uh, COVID-19 is causing, Australia remains absolutely focused on working with our key regional partners Order. to respond Senator to these longer-term challenges. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Given that a fourth woman has now come forward with sexual assault allegations against the same perpetrator, has the alleged rapist of Brittany Higgins ever held a lobbyist pass, been on the lobbyist register, or had lobbyist meetings or communications with ministers or their staff since the rape occurred? And has he visited Parliament House or any other Commonwealth office since that time? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Waters for her question. I understand Mr. Band asked a similar question in the House. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, in the House uh, indicated that he is not aware of whether, uh, whether such matters have occurred in relation to pass holders or the like. Uh, however, the Prime Minister undertook undertook to confirm those matters and to have anything attended to and advised as quickly as possible, and certainly in this place uh, I will do likewise. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. Given the role of the Department of Finance in handling staff complaints and terminations, what was the former finance minister told regarding Ms Higgins' rape allegations and the subsequent mishandling of the complaint? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I'll take the question on notice in terms of uh, uh, what advice may have been provided to uh, Minister Cormann. Um, my, uh, my understanding is that, uh, as Senator Reynolds has indicated, uh, there were instances of advice provided to her, uh, particularly in relation to uh, the termination processes that uh, exist around the individual um, who was, uh, was released due to security breaches. Um, but uh, as for any other advice or information that actually was provided to Minister Cormann, uh, as per your question, I'll bring that to the chamber. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. If, if the Prime Minister persists with the inadequate internal review by Mr Gaitchens into the mishandling of the response to Brittany Higgins's rape allegations rather than an independent investigation, will the government guarantee that Mr Gaitchens's full report will be made public? And will he have full investigative powers and access to all relevant ministers and staff when undertaking his review? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank, 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 thanks Mr President. Uh, yes, he, uh, he will have uh, such access. Uh, let me also, uh, as I stated in the chamber this morning, I understand Ms Higgins um, has made, uh, made public her intention uh, to request a full investigation with the Australian Federal Police and the government will provide complete and full uh, cooperation with that investigation, uh, as we uh, have always intended to do uh, following the uh, engagements that, uh, that Minister Reynolds uh, outlined her facilitation of earlier on. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. To date, how many employers have registered claim payments under the JobMaker Hiring Credit Scheme? And how many employers have received payments to date? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I don't have the uh, specific data that I can provide uh, the Senator at present, but I'll happily uh, bring anything that I can. Order. Senator Birmingham, in a response to an earlier question from Senator Gallagher, that the evidence was in. Senator the Gallagher. evidence was his. Senator Gallagher, was in. I'm afraid that's, that, that's not a point of order. The minister is entitled to take questions on notice, uh, and I call him to continue. Well, th th well thanks, and, uh, and indeed, I, I, I'm pleased that Senator, Senator Gallagher was was listening, or at least listening in part to uh, to what I was saying. What I was saying was the evidence was clear that a program like JobMaker was necessary, uh, and indeed that that evidence that uh, that is clear is the fact that. In targeting a program to younger workers, we can see from the ABS data, we can see from the ABS data uh, that jobs for those over 55 have actually increased uh, over time, whilst the increase for those aged 
between 15 and 34, and was actually a 3.3 per cent decrease uh, between March last year and January this year. Uh, so for those of older age groups, for those aged 35 plus, there's been an increase in employment of 1.2 per cent. For those aged over 55, there's been an increase of 2.9 per cent. For those in the JobMaker hiring credit target area, there has been a decrease in terms of employment. And so this, Mr President, was exactly what the evidence uh, and analysis that Treasury had given to us demonstrated, that there was a genuine risk in this recession, as in past recessions, that youth unemployment would be the last to recover and that you would have younger Australians potentially facing longer periods of time on unemployment. That's why, Mr President, we put in place a program targeted precisely to that cohort of individuals and that we did so making sure, making sure this program had safeguards, because I think I can predict where the supplementaries are likely to go, clear safeguards in place uh, to make sure that employment had to be additionality, had to be additional to existing numbers uh, so that there would be safeguards around existing employees, but incentives to get Order. young Australians back into jobs. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, how many new jobs have so far been created as a part of the government's job maker hiring credit scheme. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, that is very similar, I think, to the primary question, which I took on notice to uh, to provide uh, the senator uh, with any figures in relation to uh, registration and take up of the scheme. And so I will come back to the chamber with that. Uh, this scheme is at an early stage of its operation. Um, Senator Watt, Senator Watt can chuckle. So, so let me get this straight. Is it the contention of those opposite that they don't want a youth employment scheme? Is that what they're saying? Order. Is that what this lot are actually still saying? They don't want incentives to employ young Australians. Is this what I'm getting from those opposite? That they actually, they actually think there's not a problem there to worry about? Is that their contention? that somehow young Australians, well, it's fine, the statistics, the data, the evidence might all show that young Australians' employment situation is more vulnerable, but apparently they don't care. Apparently they don't care opposite. Well, guess what? We do care, and we've done something about it, and we're working to implement that program, Order, and we Senator want to make Birmingham, sure that we help young Australians the get the same— expired. Order, Senator Birmingham. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and we look forward to the evidence being forthcoming to the Chamber. Can the Minister guarantee that no worker has lost or will lose their job as a result of the government's JobMaker hiring credit scheme? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, I'm assuming uh, the prompting of these questions relates to some media reporting that I've seen today about uh, FOIs that were released by the Treasury. I think it's important, uh, given some of the selective quoting of those FOIs, to make clear that they also order, say very clearly— Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr President, direct relevance. It can't be directly relevant to refer to quotes which were not contained in the question. We've simply asked the minister to guarantee that no worker has lost or will lose their jobs. I'm reluctant, Senator Wong, to make a ruling that quoting from another document can't be relevant to the question. I've allowed you to, re to make the point. I will listen carefully to the minister's answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. That uh, those FOI documents include the statement from Treasury, and I quote, the hiring credit does not create an incentive for an employer to replace an older worker with several new part-time workers. Uh, that's what's implicit in Senator Gallagher's question, um, and uh, the government rejects that. We built this program with clear additionality criteria in place. In fact, a double-barrelled additionality test there. Uh, firstly, that the business would have to be increasing the headcount of employees, uh, and secondly, that the payroll for the business would also have to increase. So that those two criteria there to make sure uh, that indeed a business has to be taking on new employees, new additional employees, growing the payroll, and under this program, young Order. employees Senator to give young Australians Birmingham. an opportunity. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Christine Holgate led Australia Post to record re revenue levels in a period of immense challenge and has previously been praised by the Prime Minister and the Australia Post Board. Given that stakeholder ministers were briefed in late November by Ms Holgate and in December and January at meetings with members of the Licensed Post Officers Group, 
that the Chair of Australia Post made several incorrect statements when attending Senate estimates on November the 9th, in particular with reference to Ms Holgate. Why? More than three months since the Prime Minister was first made aware the Chair, Lucio Di Bartolomeo, had lied to and misled Senate estimates in evidence regarding Ms Holgate and, after she was completely exonerated by Australia Post independent inquiry, has he not taken action to hold the Chair accountable? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. <laughs> Sorry, Senator Freeman. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. My Speaker. Apologies. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Well sorry. Um, uh, I thank um, Senator Hanson for the question. Although I, I don't accept all of the characterisations made in uh, in Senator Hanson's um, question, um, particularly those in relation to Mr. Bartolomeo. Um, uh, obviously, his uh, his um, statements to parliamentary committees are on the record, and they are there for uh, scrutiny. Um, in relation to Ms. Holgate, let me say that uh, that I have. Let me say Order. that in relation to Ms Holgate, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, a very high regard uh, for, uh, for Ms Holgate, with whom I worked particularly in my previous portfolio of trade. Um, I recognise uh, the work that she did uh, whilst at Australia Post. Uh, Ms Holgate took uh, the step to resign from her position uh, following some of the evidence uh, that uh, came out uh, in the last lot of Senate estimates hearings. Uh, there has been a subsequent review in that regard. Uh, that review did make findings in relation to the purchase of Cartier watches um, that, uh, and the actions that have been undertaken uh, by Australia Post. Uh, it is, uh, and of course, Ms Holgate's decision that she resigned at the time. Uh, I do wish her well. Uh, in response to that review, uh, I, as Finance Minister, have taken steps across all government business enterprises uh, to remind them of their responsibilities under the PGPA Act. Um, and particularly uh, the responsibilities to ensure appropriate use of taxpayers' money, uh, which ultimately was the matter of concern in relation to the purchase of those Cartier watches. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, I am advised that the stood down CEO of Australia Post has not signed an agreement to resign and her standing down was not in accordance with Australia Post policy. Why is the Prime Minister protecting the Chair of Australia Post, or is this a case of the Prime Minister not being advised of a matter impacting the treatment of a high-profile female? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, no, I, I don't accept the characterisation there, um, Senator Hanson. Uh, the, uh, the statement released by Ms Holgate following Senate estimates uh, clearly indicated her public announcement of her resignation. Uh, that was a decision uh, made by Ms Holgate. Uh, as I said, I hold her in high regard. Uh, we are all capable of, uh, of making mistakes and errors of judgment in relation to certain matters. Uh, and, uh, and of course, in relation to these matters, uh, the government has sought to make sure not only that there was an appropriate review uh, which was undertaken, uh, but also now that all government business enterprises uh, are reminded of their responsibilities and obligations, uh, and I know that as a result of that review as well, Post will take further steps in relation to their procedures and practices to make sure that uh, taxpayers' money and funds are respected appropriately in the future. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Ms Holgate um, did not resign and she did not release the statement and continues to receive resounding support from the employers and contractors at Australia Post. Will the Prime Minister apologise to Ms Holgate and will the Prime Minister, who so quickly abandoned her, support Ms Holgate's continuation as CEO and what action will be taken against the Chair of Australia Post? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, Mr President, we will continue to work with the Board of Australia Post to make sure uh, that the organisation um, implements the findings of the review uh, that were undertaken. Um, as I said I don't, uh, don't accept the characterisation of some of the elements that, uh, that Senator Hanson has brought forward. Uh, Ms Holgate, uh, I wish well in relation to her future endeavours. We will continue to work uh, with uh, licensed post office uh, franchisees, uh, with, uh, with postal representatives and others across the Australia Post system to make sure that some of the good work that occurred uh, under Ms Holgate's tenure uh, continues and is advanced uh, by the new uh, chief executive, uh, the recruitment process of which is well underway. 
Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Cash. With the COVID-19 vaccine rollout now underway, could the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting Australia's multicultural communities to access the COVID-19 vaccine? The Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. And Australia's COVID-19 vaccination program is officially underway. And uh, what we saw yesterday, the 21st of February 2021, was 84-year-old World War II survivor Jane Malesiak. She was able to get the first jab. And I think it was a proud moment for all Australians. But, Mr President, during the safe and effective COVID vaccines are available to everyone in Australia is a key priority for the Morrison government. And that is why, as a government, we're extending free access to COVID-19 vaccines to all visa holders in Australia. And this will include refugees, asylum seekers, temporary protection visa holders and those on bridging visas. We also know that many people in the first groups to be vaccinated are from culturally, linguistically diverse communities, making timely access to translated and culturally appropriate information critical. The Department of Health's Vaccine Hub has translation for 63 languages available on its website and now on mobile devices. To build on this resource, the government has developed a comprehensive communications plan to reach people from cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds. The campaign itself will now run across a number of channels, including traditional and social media, and utilise existing networks of health professionals, local community and, of course, grassroots organisations. A range of translated resources have also been developed for multicultural communities, including radio and print editorials, in-language web content, social media posts and posters. We're also working with SBS to produce short explainer videos on the vaccine rollout in more than 60 languages and the Migration Council of Australia on an animated vaccine explainer in 29 languages. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How do these supports for our multicultural communities complement our broader vaccine rollout strategy? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as you've heard from both the Prime Minister and the Minister for Health, our vaccine rollout ensures that people who are most at risk and who need protection the most will receive a vaccine first. The Pfizer vaccine will be administered through hospital vaccination clinics in each state and territory and in aged care and disability care facilities across Australia. Approximately 80,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine will be released in the first week. Under the Australian Government's plan, quarantine and border workers and aged care residents are on track to be vaccinated by April 2021. In addition to our support for multicultural communities, our public information campaign will keep Australians up to date about the safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccinations, including how and when to get the vaccine. Our key message to Australians is that it is safe, it is effective and will protect you and your loved ones. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will our COVID-19 vaccination rollout support Australia's economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the COVID-19 vaccination rollout is a crucial next step in our economic recovery. For our most affected businesses, in particular in the tourism sector, the arts and events in industries, the vaccine will be particularly welcomed. We're already emerging from the COVID-19 recession in a way that very few advanced economies are. We've seen now over 800,000 jobs, and that's approximately 93 per cent of those lost during COVID-19 return to the economy. We're continuing to see consumer confidence, business confidence and job ads grow to levels higher than before the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the impacts of COVID-19, an additional 46,000 businesses were trading over the year to June 2020. Around $200 billion in our economic support is sitting on the balance sheet of family and businesses, providing a long tail of economic stimulus to support our recovery. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. 
At any time did the minister disclose to the Prime Minister that her former staff member, Ms Higgins, had made allegations that she was raped in the minister's office? If not, why not? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And in short, uh, no, I didn't. And the reason for that, as I've consistently said here in this chamber, that it was not my story to tell, it never was. So I at all times took my lead uh, from Brittany Higgins in terms of what support she needed uh, and who, who was to know about this and who was not. And the advice is always, whether it's from 1800 Respect, whether it's uh, from others, you always take the lead of the individual, and that is what I did. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. At any time did the minister disclose to any of the Prime Minister's staff that her former staff member, Ms Higgins, had made allegations that she was raped in the minister's office? If not, why not? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, I'll refer back to my previous answer, is that at all times I took my counsel from Brittany Higgins in terms of making sure she had, making sure she had the right, the right su support. And order, Senator Reynolds. I have Senator Wong on a point I of order. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the very relevance. Uh, the question before we get to the justification was whether or not the minister had disclosed the fact of the alleged rape to any of the Prime Minister's staff, and I'd ask the minister to return to that question. Senator Wong, you've restated the first part of the question. Um, I believe the minister was being directly relevant with the answer, and she's concluded her answer. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. At any time did the minister disclose to any other minister that her former staff member, Ms Higgins, had made allegations that she was raped in the minister's office? If yes, which ministers and when? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you, Mr President. And I, again, refer you back to uh, I took my counsel at all times from the advice that I received and that it order. was about Senator Ms Higgins' Wong, choice. Of, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Reynolds. Senator Di Wong. Direct relevance, yes, it is about Ms Higgins, and she has made her views very clear, and we are asking you questions about your conduct. And the question that I'm asking you to return to, through you, Mr President, is whether or not you disclose the allegation of rape to any other ministers, and if so, when? I, I believe, Senator Wong, the minister is being directly relevant by it. Um, I believe... The, I, can't, I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question. I, I believe if the minister is explaining the reasons for a course of action that were raised in the question, that that is being directly relevant to the question. There's an opportunity after question time to debate it. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. And uh, Senator McCarthy, in her question, is assuming uh, the nature of a private conversation, the private conversations that I had with Ms Higgins. And I've consistently... I have, I have consistently said that it is not my story to tell, it is hers. And I will not, I will not, privacy, her privacy and in terms of any conversations we had were never mine to reveal and they are still not mine to reveal. Senator Wong on a point of order. Order, direct relevance. We are not asking about private conversations with Ms Higgins. We are asking whether this minister disclosed those allegations to other ministers and if so, when. This minister is accountable to this chamber, Mr President, for her conduct. Um, I, no, she I'm hasn't interpreting the minister's answers as giving reasons for the course of action she took or didn't took, so I, I don't want to rule that as not directly relevant. Senator Reynolds? Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I say again that in the question that I was just asked in that last supplementary, it makes assumptions about what may or may not have been said in that conversation. And I am not, I am not going to say anything that breaches the confidence of that conversation. And you are, you Order, are assuming, Reynolds, time assuming for the things has about expired. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Seselja. The Morrison government has committed $1.5 billion to the modern manufacturing strategy to assist Australian manufacturers across six national priority areas to scale up, improve competitiveness Order. and build more resilient supply chains. 
Can the minister please update the Senate on the delivery of the strategy? The minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question, a very good question. The government launched the $1.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy as part of the 2020-21 budget. It is a key feature of our job maker plan designed to harness Australia's manufacturing capability, drive our economic recovery and ensure future resilience. It's all about jobs and using the best Australian science and technology to scale up our manufacturing businesses for the long term. And delivery of the strategy is on track and it is well advanced. In fact, on Friday, the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology visited a great local business, Skycraft, to launch the $1.3 billion Modern Manufacturing Initiative and the first of our detailed industry roadmaps which have been developed by government in partnership with industry and will inform our grant delivery. Now, the first sector to be rolled out is space and our other five priority sectors will be launched in the coming weeks. Businesses in the space sector can now apply for grants in two of the three streams of the initiative. Now, these two streams are designed to help businesses translate their great ideas into commercial outcomes and support projects that integrate Australian businesses into global supply chains. For these two streams, the translation and integration streams, the Commonwealth will cover up to 50 per cent of the project costs. Now, this initiative is all about scaling up manufacturing to grow jobs, so the minimum grant will be $1 million. This is match funding uh, because we believe that industry has to have skin in the game. I'm also pleased to advise that our stream to help SMEs improve their production, the Manufacturing Modernisation Fund, is also well underway with grants between $100,000 and $1 million available. More than 500 applications were received and when the round closed last month and they are currently being assessed. And we expect that successful applicants will start to receive their funding this financial year. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Given space is the first of the sector priority area to be open for funding, can the minister outline the opportunities for businesses in the space sector? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President, and yes, I can. Space not only captures the public imagination uh, and opens up new worlds, investment in space technology has practical benefits for our everyday lives. Now, from technology helping emergency workers plan for bushfires and farmers manage their crops to advances in automation, robotics, engineering and satellite technology. Now, the Space National Manufacturing Priority Roadmap identifies key areas of opportunity for government and industry to work together to lift space manufacturing capability, drive collaboration by helping Australian businesses demonstrate their space qualified products and facilitate access to domestic and global supply chains. Now, this will help Australian businesses compete for a slice of the growing global space industry and there are benefits right down the line for business. For example, Canberra Business Skycraft are building small satellite constellations to help improve our communications, travel and banking. They've teamed up with local Canberra manufacturer Extech to produce the carbon the fire has expired. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the Minister more broadly outline how Australia is engaging with the international community to enhance opportunities in the space sector? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and yes, I can. The global space spec sector is currently worth over $350 billion, and our goal is to make sure our Australian businesses can get access to that market. That's why the Liberal National Government established the Australian Space Agency. And we've now entered into a number of formal agreements uh, with international space agencies, including uh, in the UK, UAE, EU, US, Japan, India and others. Australia is one of the seven founding international partners who have signed the Artemis Accords. This is a practical set of principles for cooperation among, among nations participating in NASA's 21st century lunar exploration. Our government is ensuring our local industry has the opportunity to benefit from the Artemis mission with our Moon to Mars initiative, which provides grants to businesses to help them become part of the supply chain for the mission. It's an exciting era for the Australian space industry, and this government is backing it all Order. the way. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I refer to reports that at least four women have been come forward with allegations of alleged sexual assault or harassment, 
and raped by the same former staff member. One former Liberal staffer who alleges she was raped has said, and I quote, if this has been properly dealt with by, with, by the government in 2019, this would not have happened to me. Did any member of the ministry or their staff have knowledge of this alleged sexual assault prior to the public report? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, I don't believe uh, there is a uh, case to believe, as Senator Sheldon uh, has uh, suggested there. Uh, I will uh, come back to the chamber if there is anything to the contrary in that regard. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. A third woman, who was a volunteer for the coalition in the 2016 election campaign, says she was barely out of school when she was allegedly sexually assaulted by the former staff member who was working in a minister's office at the time. Did any member of the ministry or their staff have knowledge of this alleged sexual assault prior to this public report? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, again, not to my knowledge. Um, and I have no reason to believe uh, that would be the case. Uh, if there is anything that, uh, that changes that, I will let you know, Senator Sheldon. Uh, obviously, all of these allegations are incredibly uh, traumatic and distressing uh, and underpin uh, the crucial work that, uh, that needs to be undertaken to uh, give uh, all women, all people, uh, confidence uh, in relation to uh, the processes and procedures that are there uh, to enable and to support them uh, to uh, report such instances uh, such that uh, perpetrators and offenders can be brought uh, to justice. Um, and certainly, as I've said in this chamber already, uh, the government will give full cooperation to the AFP as they uh, work with Ms Higgins, as she has publicly indicated, um, as I would expect us to do in any and all circumstances of such uh, terrible matters. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Another survivor of alleged sexual assault, Chelsea Potter, has today spoken of the minister's refusal to speak with her. Can the minister explain his response to this request? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, I can. Uh, Ms Potter, whose story has been uh, well publicised uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald in, uh, in July of 2019, I think, uh, I first became aware of uh, Chelsea's claims uh, after my office was approached by journalists from the Sydney Morning Herald shortly before publication. Uh, in between uh, being contacted by the journalist and publication, uh, Chelsea sent me a text message to ask if I would like to catch up for a beer with her. Uh, I was unable to at the time, but I replied uh, indicating that I was aware of uh, the conversation she was having with the media, uh, encouraging her to seek uh, independent and professional assistance uh, I suggested organisations such as 1800 Respect uh, or the South Australian Women's Information Service uh, as appropriate avenues. Uh, I've indicated uh, in relation to Chelsea and indeed others uh, that through the process this parliament I hope will undertake uh, that we can, I hope, engage with them uh, such that uh, they can feel uh, that that process uh, helps to address uh, the matters of, uh, of concern they rightly have from their past experiences and that we can all have uh, an improved understanding of how to prevent these issues uh, and better, to re better respond to them in the future. Senator Small. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. And it's something that's close to my heart and I know close to the hearts of those on the government benches. How is the Morrison government assisting Australians with disabilities to enter and remain in the Australian workforce? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Small for his, uh, his question and acknowledge um, his commitment, along with the commitment of this government, to breaking down barriers for Australians who find themselves or who have disability um, who find themselves unemployed. Um, as we emerge from the impacts of the, the COVID pandemic, it is really, really important that we focus on jobs for everybody, but particularly to make sure that people with disability get the same opportunities um, as everybody else to make sure that they can make their contribution to the economic security and wellbeing of our country. Because we know 
um, that a job is a real game changer for anybody, and that shouldn't be any different for somebody who, uh, who lives with disability. Uh, and that's why um, we are in the process of develop developing the National um, Disability Employment Strategy. And uh, I'm really delighted to say, and it's probably very topical this week, um, that I have appointed uh, the 2016 uh, Australian Paralympian of the Year, Dylan Alcott, uh, in conjunction with the, the Monash University Vice-Chancellor, Simon McCown, as the, uh, the joint chairs of the new Disability Employment Advisory Committee. And I say timely because uh, last week um, a very inspirational Australian in Dylan Alcott um, won his seventh consecutive Australian uh, Open um, <laughs> Uh, disability or, or um, wheelchair title, which is just fantastic and a great inspiration uh, for young Australians who live with disability to show uh, the, the amazing things that you can do. And so I congratulate Dylan uh, on his amazing achievement. But together with Pro Professor McCown, they are providing absolutely essential advice about ways to positively drive change to assist Australians to gain um, ma and maintain employment to the level of their ability. Uh, and these, uh, these two gentlemen are supported by a number of people who, other people who live with disability to make sure that our disability employment strategy is informed by people with disability. Uh, we want to invest heavily in breaking down the barriers because we know that people with disability can make some of the most outstanding employees, and that's a message we want to get out to employees Order, so Senator they employ Rustin. them. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, can you outline the key priorities of that national disability strategy? strategy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, first and foremost, the most important thing that we need to do in the development of the National Disability Strategy is to make sure that we get the states and territories and local governments, the community, businesses, everybody in our society to come on the journey with us, because it will only be through consultation with everybody, but very much through consultation with people dis with disability, that we will be able to bring this new strategy uh, into effect later this year. Um, but most particularly, the National Disability Strategy will have a very, very strong focus on employment, but particularly on financial security, on education, on health, and making sure that we change community attitudes so that people with disability will be able to take, uh, take on opportunities for employment and incorporate the key elements um, of the broader strategy, employment, uh, dis disability employment strategy. We want employers to understand the advantages of employing people with disability, and that means that we must make sure that our recruitment processes Order, are appropriately Senator Rustin, targeted. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. In recognising work as not only an economic but a wellbeing construct, how is the government supporting young Australians experiencing mental illness into work? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, uh, and I thank Senator Small because this is a very, very important issue. Um, one of the things that was recently announced in, uh, in the budget was an additional $45 million to more than double the number of headspace um, uh, sites around Australia that have got um, the independent um, placement and support program. Uh, this program, um, which now will be ro rolled out over 50 sites across Australia, um, is a very targeted program to make sure that we provide the clinical mental health support to young Australians, but at the same time use that support to be able to help them uh, on a pathway or a trajectory to secure employment. Because we know that the onset um, of mental illness often occurs in young people. However, we know that we can significantly uh, assist these people to, to transition, uh, to help them with their, their issues uh, by assisting them in the transition to work. So under the IPS program, uh, we want to make sure that people can have access to things like job coaching, targeted education Order. and Senator employment Rustin, opportunities. Senator Rustin, time for the answer has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Mr President. I have a question this afternoon for Senator Reynolds, the Minister for Defence. Reports indicate the Minister, then Chief of Staff, sought advice from the Department of Finance about the handling of an alleged sexual assault. When did the Minister first become aware her Chief of Staff was seeking that advice? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I, as I said in my statement uh, last week, that I became incrementally aware over a period of days of Brittany's stories with private conversations uh, with her and my then Chief of Staff, and also via reports from parliamentary authorities. And when I met with uh, Brittany on Monday, 
uh, we made sure that she had the appropriate support and also had access to the Australian Federal Police, which she did. And beyond that, I'm certainly not going to go into any more detail about those private conversations. Se Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. When did you as Minister, through you Mr President, first see that advice and what action did you take? Senator Reynolds. Uh, I, I, look, I could not have been any clearer in answering this. Uh, there was a course of conversations, as I said last week, uh, and as, as incrementally as those conversations, the privacy of which I have maintained and I still maintain, I will not breach the privacy of those conversations. Order, Senator, sorry, Senator, what? Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Mr President, um, this minister is accountable to the Australian people through this chamber. We are not asking her questions about what discussions occurred with Ms Higgins, although Ms Higgins' statements can speak for themselves. It is a very straightforward question. When did you first see the advice and what action did you take? I would ask you to ask the minister to come back to the question, otherwise really one wonders about the purpose of question time if ministers are allowed to obfuscate Order. and duck Senator in this Wong, way. I've allowed you to restate the question. My view on this matter is if the minister is explaining the reasoning behind a course of action taken, that that is directly... Uh, th 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 there's, there's, a, there's an opportunity after question time for debate, but I... So are you on the point of order, Senator, Senator Pratt? You asked the question on the point of order? Ministers, in answering questions, are not able to... Re we can ask questions of fact uh, and we are asking in this case for a date. Yeah, um, when did the minister first see that advice and what action? Now, we are able to ask direct questions. I've been through many of these iterations in estimates where we're told we can ask for facts and dates without okay. revealing what Thank that you, advice Senator was. Pratt. We're not um, asking uh, for the Pratt. advice, we're asking for Senator a Pratt, date. Senator Pratt, please. Se Senator Pratt, my view on this matter is that if the minister is explaining a course of action that she took, um, I, then I, it's not up to me. If that is directly relevant to the question being asked, and I'm listening, I'm listening carefully, I've allowed opposition senators to restate the question. There's an opportunity to debate the content of answers, but I'm not in a position to direct. direct. I, 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 I will listen carefully to, to Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I have said, I have said many times now in this chamber, that it became, I became aware of this incrementally in terms of the circumstances. And on the Monday when I met with Ms. Higgins, order. Senator Watt, on a point of order, on relevance, we're not asking about the chain of events. We're asking a very specific question around when this minister became aware about this piece of advice. On the point of order, we only got about eight seconds into the minister's uh, answer. Um, if the minister is explaining a course of action, I'm going to decree that to be directly relevant. I do take the point; it was a very narrow question, so the course of action around um, direct the, the course of action needs to be explained in the context of being directly relevant to the point asked. Opposition senators have had the opportunity to make the question again, but I can't instruct the minister how nor the content of an answer to a question. And I've allowed, uh, I, I, Senator Wong, I've allowed opposition senators to do so, and I've just advised that a course of action can be explained and it needs to be directly relevant. The question was quite specific. I'll call Senator Reynolds to continue. I'm listening very carefully. Senator Reynolds. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I do have no more to answer on this uh, because I have covered this. I have I have covered this. I have covered this at great length. The fact is, those opposite in their questions, by the nature Order. of their questions, are asking questions that go to the heart, that go to the heart of Order. the private conversations that I had. Order. And I, at the Senator time, Reynolds, I respected time for the her privacy. Has I respect Order. Senator Pratt, a final supplement. Order, Senator Reynolds, time for the answer has expired. Senator Pratt, a Mr. final President, supplement. Ms. Higgins question. has said that when police involvement was raised at the meeting with the Minister and her Chief of Staff on the 1st of April 2019, that she was told, and I quote, 
We need to know now. Why was this said? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, uh, this is Brittany Higgins' story to tell publicly. Uh, it is not. It, Order. It is not. It is not. It, respecting her privacy, respecting the process that she is going through, it is simply not my position, respecting her agency and privacy, Senator to Wong say anything Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The minister should not hide behind Ms Higgins' courage. These are Ms Higgins' words and her account of what occurred. The chamber is asking this minister to explain why those words were said. I, I believe in this case, Senator Wong, it is particularly clear that the minister is explaining the reasoning for the answer she is giving, so I'm not in a position to instruct her to answer it differently. Um, there is the opportunity immediately following question time to debate these matters. Senator Reynolds? I've finished my answer. Order. Senator Birmingham. The further questions be placed on notice. Motions to take note of answers. Senator Stirl. And, and uh, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Birmingham uh, to questions from Senator Gallagher and Gallagher. And I know it sounds like an oxymoron because there was no answers to the questions. Um, here we go, another day, another announcement. One would think with this mob over here that going to come to the end of March, what we do know is that some, I think, four and a half million, uh, no, more than that it is, it's actually three, sorry, three and a half million jobs that are currently being supported by JobKeeper are going to end. We also know that there's a $4 billion announcement from this mob over here that says they're going to create opportunities for employers to get some money to create uh, opportunities for young people. Uh, um, and their figure was 450,000 jobs. So when Senators Gallagher and Gallagher asked Minister Birmingham how about how many numbers would be gone, how many jobs would be lost, typically we got nothing. Now we shouldn't sound surprised. So someone who experienced youth unemployment in my hometown of Fremantle back in the uh, 90s, there is nothing worse than when you see 21, 22 per cent, whatever it was, of youth unemployment in Frio let alone the youth unemployment that's going to come now. And what we do know is the majority of these jobs that are in hospitality and such and, and retail, the good chances are that there will be a lot of young people that will be unemployed. But where the problem I have with this, this announcement job maker, everything has got a job in front of it, it's, it's so sm uh, smoky, it is so murky and so lacking in detail. And to the point where Senator Birmingham, because he's always half too cute, so Senator Birmingham thinks that the best way he can deflect and not have to answer a question is to scream into the microphone at decibels that normally pierce all our ears, and he thinks that he's got away with it. Well, Senator Birmingham, you're in for a rude shock. You didn't get away with it. Because one of your failings is when you get a little bit too clever, Senator Birmingham, is when you, you said you could almost... Um, uh, what was it? Uh, work out what the supplementaries would be. Then you also said something about a, a report in the media. Well, the report in the media, I think, that you would be referring to is the only one I've seen so far, was actually freedom of information done by the ABC. Freedom of Information, Senator of Birmingham, where you're trying to deflect with your loud voice and not answering questions, uh, of uh, documents obtained by uh, uh, freedom of information of the AT of Treasury. Quite simply, Treasury. It's not the Guardian, it's not the betootal advice or whatever it is, or your other or your mad wing right wing um, media you guys read, which actually says very clearly, tune the Treasury's own examples obtained by the ABC using the Freedom of Information process shows bosses could sack a full-time employee on $75,000 and replace him or her with three part-time staff on wages between 22,000 
and 30,000 while remaining in front financially thanks to the generous job maker hiring credit. It was pretty simple. Opposition senators didn't make it up. That's Treasury. You know that mob down the road down here? Um, now, my other fear is getting rid of older workers. And it's a well known fact, and you think if this mob had any decency over there, they'd be trying to work out you know, how to do this properly, how to do it sincerely, how to look after all workers. But what about rural workers? You hear, you hear the peanut gallery over here, the doormats, who are carrying on all the time. Oh, gosh, I miss Bozzy. You know, what happened to the last of the real Nats? Bozzy and Senator Barry O'Brien, Senator Wacker Williams, real decent representatives of the regions. The rest of you should be ashamed. I'll bring them back tomorrow, I tell you what. They've forgotten more than this mob will ever know about representing regions. What about all these jobs in the regions? We heard them banging on a couple of weeks ago. Where are they now? The silence is deafening. And the laugh when you see the blue sign that looks like the green and yellow sign, Liberals, what do you call yourselves? Regional Liberals. <laughs> Forgot Senator Heffernan and he wouldn't have put up with this nonsense. They were the good old representatives of the uh, conservative side of politics for regional jobs. Not, not this lot over here. Absolutely shameful. Oh, some of you are all right. Some of you are all right. I'll take it back. So here we go again. So look, it just makes sense. It makes sense. Now, not all employers, but a lot of employers, not, some employers would do this. How lip smackingly exciting would it be for the opportunity for some scrupulous employers? to get rid of older employees, casualise their full-time jobs or put them on part-time. Here we go again, insecure work, taking away full-time jobs for permanent jobs. With, with Seriously, where is your moral compass to think if you're going to do something, do it properly? What are the unintended consequences? Not smarty aleck answers, but that decibels that pierce people's ears and you don't answer anything. Thank you, Senator. All right, I'll, I'll keep going if you want. If I can no, seek extension. No, your time has expired. Oh, okay. Uh, Senator Holly, uh, Senator Hughes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'd love to go for some reason I've forgotten my surname, but always go by Senator Holly. It's uh, it's nice to see that everyone follows me on Instagram and knows where to go. Uh, you know, Senator Sell, I'm not even sure what that was about. I mean, that was just extraordinary. It was all over the place, and I guess. Being able to rehash all of those old white men that used to be the uh, stalwarts of the Senate, uh, I hope uh, you welcome the diversity that we now see. And, I, and I'm so pleased to be part of this place when we now have over 50 per cent women. So it certainly gives a little different flavour to the place. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's always great to get the views of uh, a range of Australians. And I guess that's why. You know, when we look at a range of Australians, we look at how we can best support all Australians. And we've just experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we start the vaccine rollout and look to the future and look how we can get back to work and get all of Australians back to work and our economy back to where it was to pre-COVID levels, that travel resumes, international borders can open up and we start to see life resume back to normal. It has been this government that has continually put in place targeted programs to ensure all Australians get the best opportunity, but that also the taxpayers' dollars are going where they should go. Not this carte blanche Prime Minister Rudd special where we were sending cheques to dead, dead people, where you know schools were getting great, wonderful halls that were so overinflated in price, where we saw Deaths literally occurred during to the speedy rollout of ineffective programs. But the Morrison government has put in place targeted, sensible economic programs that have ensured most Australians can be supported through this terrible time and that we can acknowledge that since the pandemic started, over 93% of jobs that were lost or hours gone to zero have been returned. That's 93%. We're now seeing women's participation at almost the same level that was a record high pre-COVID. But we do recognise that there are certain cohorts that will need more support than others. We're seeing older Australians being employed at a higher rate than ever before. But we are seeing at the younger end of the workforce market that there is a higher rate of unemployment, that those jobs are slower to come back on board. And that's why the Morrison government has been so focused on programs to support apprentices, to make sure that businesses can keep their apprentices on. And we've, we've done that through programs such as uh, Home Builder, 
where in one of the areas that I have the privilege of looking after in the Hunter, builders and construction workers cannot keep up with demand. But it's not only those small businesses in the area, it's all those supplementary businesses, the businesses that supply the tiles and the faucets and the grout. Those businesses are struggling to keep up with demand. And it's because of that program and those initiatives that we're seeing apprentices being kept on board and younger people in the workforce. Now, we've also looked towards the job maker hiring credit. And this is because we know from experience, and perhaps if those opposite were big enough to be able to look back and make sensible decisions and have sensible discussions, they'd remember that in the previous recession, it was the younger part of the workforce that was impacted for the longest period of time. So in an effort to ensure that we don't see long-term unemployment occurring in our younger part of the workforce, that we're not entrenching disadvantage and unemployment for those under 34, the Jobmaker Hiring Credit is a program where employers are bringing new people into the business, not seeing people just being supplemented and subsidised, that new people are being brought into the business, that jobs are being created to ensure that those members under 34 of our workforce are given an opportunity to get back to work as quickly as possible and that we ensure we don't entrench long-term unemployment, that we don't entrench disadvantage and we don't lose a generation to the workforce. Now, the economic recovery is underway and I have absolute faith that the Morrison government will continue to roll out programs that are focused, that are targeted, that ensure that most Australians are set to benefit and the best bang for the buck of taxpayers' dollars is what's allowed to occur. We know that those opposite voted against JobMaker. They won't answer the question why they don't support young workers. But this government, with this Prime Minister, will ensure all Australians, including our young workforce, are supported as much as possible. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Carr. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, today, the leader of the government in the Senate was asked a very simple question. When JobKeeper ends at the end of the March, how many people will lose their jobs? It was a straightforward question, direct and simple, but of course there were no direct or simple answers to that question. In fact, what we received today was a proposition from the government that simply said that we had to make choices and priorities had to be set because there was a limit on the amount of money that the government had available because there was no bottomless pit of taxpayers' money available, that it was borrowed money. And as Senator Hughes has rightfully pointed out, I think that not all people in this country have been treated equally because not all people in this country have, of course, been able to deal with the economic crisis uh, in, in equal measures. I found that a particularly interesting proposition, given that the JobKeeper program had promised so much but had delivered so little, particularly when we consider the number of companies that have accepted public money and in do so doing, I would suggest, had a moral obligation to use that money properly. And when it comes to the question of priorities, and there would be a great deal more money available if the government had provided much sharper attention to the issue of where that money was actually spent, including companies such as Premier Investments, the firm controlled by one of Australia's richest men, had shut down many of its stores as the pandemic took hold. They included outlets such as Just Jeans, Delotti, Portman's and Spiegel. The company received $40 million in JobKeeper. They earned bigger profits in 2020 than they did in 2019. Its shareholders uh, received some $57 million in dividends and, of course, that some $20 million went to Mr Liu. CEO Mark Innes received a $2.5 million the revival of the company's fortune, of course, is a good thing, it will be argued. But did premium investments repay any of the JobKeeper money? The answer was no. The Business Council says the companies receiving JobKeeper funds should not repay executive bonuses. And some firms, such as I think they acted ethically, Toyota, Super Retail Group, for example, they repaid $18 million of the $1.7 million respectively. They had no legal obligation to do so, 
no request from the government to do so, no concern about the moral obligation they had to do so, no sense of political or moral priority. And when the government talks about not having enough money to deal with those people that are suffering in this country and are continuing to suffer in this country as a result of the pandemic and, of course, as a result of the continuing economic crisis. No way that this government, of course, is in the slightest bit interested in Premier's investment. The JobKeeper received assistance, of course, was provided by the millions and was paid in dividends to those shareholders who increased their profits. And, of course, we have the situation of Mr James Packer's Crown Casino. And I read in the press today, and the minister talks about press articles today, where the universities were contrasted uh, by Ross Garneau with that of the operations of our casinos. And Mr Roscano points out, few would doubt the superiority of universities over casinos in terms of their national contribution. Crown employed 15,000 people, universities employed 130,000 people directly and hundreds of thousands more indirectly. Who, of course, got the money? Crown. And was the universities of this country open to any assistance? No, not unless they were, of course, private universities. There were, of course, five or four private universities, Notre Dame, Bonn, Corrins and the University of Divinity. They got money, but not the public universities of this country. Now, of course, what does this tell us about the government's priorities? It tells us an enormous amount when a government talks about their intentions about not having enough money to help people who are suffering, people who are facing acute economic crisis and continue to do so, particularly at a time when the government is withdrawing support from those Australians at the end of March, when of course the government has the resources but is choosing to spend that money on its mates, on those political priorities, which of course aim Thank at helping you, Senator those Carr, your time that don't has expired, Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Senator Stirl's kind comments with respect to two predecessors from the state of Queensland, namely uh, the great Senator Ron Boswell and also Senator Barry O'Sullivan. And I absolutely agree with Senator Stirl's reflections on those two gentlemen that they were absolutely fearless and resolute defenders of regional Australia. And whilst they were in this place, they did all they could reasonably do to promote uh, the health of the regions. And I was actually thinking of Senator Ron Boswell uh, Friday before last when I was celebrating the Lunar New Year with the great Vietnamese community in Queensland, the Tet Festival. And of course, Senator Ron Boswell had an extremely affectionate relationship with the Vietnamese community in Queensland. And I'm certainly doing my best uh, to continue that great tradition. Senator Stirl made some comments with the, in relation to the job maker hiring credit. And He's, he's run this example, and it's been run a few times, that there are all these employers out there that are looking to sack employees, and I'll use Senator Stirl's example, who are perhaps earning $75,000 a year and replace them with three junior employees using the job maker making hiring credit. And I'll say to Senator Stirl this. First, certainly my experience in the private sector if an employer has a valued employee, the last thing they want to do is to lose that employee. And that is really the best check and balance of all, the fact that employers are seeking quality employees. Second point I'd make to Senator Still is that there are a number of checks and balances in the system to ensure that employers can't rot the system. And that includes checks and balances which the ATR will run with respect to companies aggregate payrolls to ensure that those new employees who the employer is claiming the job maker hiring credit for are additional employees. They're not replacement employees. They're not employees replacing uh, long-term senior employees. They are additional employees. And the third point I'd make with respect to Senator Stirl's uh, commentary with respect to the job maker hiring credit 
is that all the usual employee protections continue to apply with respect to employees, and that includes Australia's very tight unfair dismissal laws. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I'm actually extremely positive with respect to the job making hiring credit. Uh, certainly, I graduated from university in 1992 uh, into the recession we had to have. And Senator Smith said, me too. Um, happy to be in that corner with you, Senator Smith. And it was extremely difficult, extremely difficult for people my age to obtain jobs at that point in time. And I certainly had friends who struggled for a number of years to enter into the employment uh, sphere. So I think the job maker hiring credit is an extremely positive program. It, it will cost up to $4 billion. And Treasury, Treasury has estimated that it will generate up to 450,000 jobs. And if, if, if employers do the wrong thing, then I certainly support the notion that the Australian Taxation Office and the regulators should hold them to account. And I think the Australian people expect nothing less. Senator Kim Carr's contribution to this debate uh, I will deal with next. And when Sen Senator Carr speaks, I always um, listen very carefully. I listen to very, Senator Carr very carefully. I serve with him on a number of committees and I have a great regard for his views with respect to a range of subjects. And I'll just say this with respect to, I'll just say this with respect to Senator Carr's reflections on companies that received the JobKeeper credit and then announced uh, great profits. And I'll put it this way. I have a great deal of respect for those companies that received the JobKeeper credit and then, after considering the circumstances of the company, uh, the respective company over 12 months decided to repay, repay amounts to the Commonwealth Government. I think that was the entirely appropriate thing to do. I applaud those companies. I think they have earned their social licence in our civic community and I think all companies in that situation should carefully reflect upon what the right thing to do is. Does any of that reflect on the success of the JobKeeper program? Absolutely not. It has been an outstanding success, an outstanding success, and that should be acknowledged from representatives on all sides of this chamber. And it's a great thing that in Queensland over 728,500 oh, employees uh, sorry, receive Senator payments. Star, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. For many Australians last year, 2020 was their most challenging year in living memory. You know, tens of thousands lost livelihoods and for the first time found themselves in receipt of government assistance. And boy, do we remember phone calls running hot in my office and no doubt offices around the country. Thousands required the assistance, not just by JobKeeper, but by other government support, simply so they could make ends meet at their, at their homes, so they could just pay for the bills, pay for the mortgage. A lot were reduced to tears, and for many people experiencing what it means to be on government welfare. Whilst for some the beginning of 2021 saw a return to a relatively normal start to the year in some ways, it is folly to think that these circumstances apply to all. For many Australians, JobKeeper continues to provide a much needed lifeline, keeping them connected to their workplaces and the bills at bay. And I'm deeply concerned listening to other honourable senators in this place the attitude that comes to the debate before us, the attitude that we had heard today, or lack of, in question time, the effect that a premature withdrawal of JobKeeper will have on many workers around this country, especially those in industries that are still yet to get back on their feet. So I can think of a few, tourism and hospitality, retail, but I do want to touch on aviation. Late yesterday, one of my staff came to this place, travelling from Melbourne, and he encountered 
a pilot. A pilot who's only been given one shift every month. And in discussions with that pilot, he made it very clear that him and his wife are struggling. Thankful that, yes, they are receiving job keeper, but still struggling to make ends meet, struggling to pay for their school fees for their children. And even him going to get a cup of coffee, the lady over the counter felt sorry for him and actually offered to give him a discount for his cup of coffee. But these are the real stories, the real people, the real impact that by withdrawing JobKeeper will have on many, many households around this nation. Working families unable to pay for their bills, unable to send their kids to school and probably unlikely to pay for dinner, for lunch or even breakfast as well too. But somehow government senators seem to think, oh well, the economy has just got to get back on track, snap back as they claim. But we do see and will continue to have state governments around the country imposing lockdowns because the spread will continue. The spread of the coronavirus will continue, especially whilst people from overseas do enter Australia, and for good reason. But we know that the numbers will be great. The numbers of people that will suffer will be great. The Reserve Bank Governor has told us himself the government's own Treasury Secretary has told us that a pause on the labour market will have an impact on the economy. Now, whilst the government might seek to hide behind non-answers in this place on questions of job losses after the premature end of JobKeeper, we know that for many Australians, the answer will be painfully clear at the end of March. Is this the best that those opposite can muster? Is this the best that they can do to support Australians whilst they're doing it tough? Let me say that this is simply just not good enough, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Still to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.